I again. Page 258 of Christianity and the Social Crisis. We're dealing with the present crisis and the and Rauschenbusch is in distress about the growing gap between the rich and the poor. To what extent the judges are actually corrupt, is, it is probably impossible to say. This is 1907. We have been trying to keep up our courage amid the general official corruption by asserting that the integrity of the judiciary, at least, is above reproach. But the only thing that would make them immune to the general disease is the spirit and the tradition of their profession. But class spirit and professional honor are a rather fragile barrier against the terrible temptations which can be offered by the great interests. And when that barrier is once undermined by evil example, it will wash away with increasing speed. Recent revelations have not been calculated to cheer us. The judge is frequently a successful politician before he sits on the bench. It is the sanctifying, is the sanctifying power of official responsibility so great that it will purge out the habits of mind acquired by a successful political career as politics now goes. At any rate, it is safe to say that the study and practice of the law create an ingrained respect for things as they have been, and that the social sympathies of judges are altogether likely to be with the educated and possessing classes. This inward trend of sympathy is a powerful element in determining a man's judgment in single cases. That a man should be tried by a jury of his peers was so important an historical conquest because it recognized the bias of class differences and turned it in favor of the accused. Unless a judge is affected by the new social spirit, he's likely to be at least unconsciously on the side of those who have, and this is equivalent to a special privilege granted them by the courts. Connecticut alone, among English-speaking countries, has hitherto permitted the defendant in damage suits to transfer such suits from a jury to a bench of judges. When the Constitution of Connecticut was revised in 1902, it was proposed to make jury trials mandatory in damage suits. The active corporation group in the convention bent its chief interest toward the defeat of this proposition. In the experience of corporations, judges must then be more favor favorably disposed to them than juries. The ultimate power on which we stake our hope in our present political decay is the power of public opinion. Whenever some temporary victory has been scored by the people, the newspapers triumphantly announce that the people are really still sovereign and that nothing can resist public opinion when once aroused. In reality, this sheet anchor of our hope is as dependable as the wind that blows. It takes strenuous efforts to arouse the public. Only spectacular evils are likely to impress it. When it is aroused, it is easily turned against some side issue or some harmless scapegoat. And like all passions, it is very short-lived and sinks back to slumber quickly. Despotic governments have always trusted in dilatory tactics, knowing well the somnolence of public opinion. The same policy is adroitly used by those who exploit the people in our country. To this must be added the fact that the predatory interests are tampering with the organs which create public opinion. If public opinion is indeed so great a power, it is not likely that it will be overlooked by those who are so alert against all other sources of danger. It will not be denied that some newspapers are directly in the pay of certain interests and are their active champions. It will not be denied that the counting room standpoint is profoundly influential in the editorial policy of all newspapers and that large advertisers can muzzle most papers if they are determined on a policy. Not only the editorials are affected, but the news matter. After the first great election in Chicago in 1902, in which the people by referendum decided for municipal ownership of street railways and the gas and electric lighting plants by an astonishing majority. The Associated Press dispatches and the great New York dailies were almost or wholly silent on this significant demonstration of public ownership sentiment. After the presidential election of 1892, in which the Populist Party played such 
has played so prominent a part, I was unable to find any figures on their vote in the New York dailies. The day after the presidential election in 1904, in which the socialist vote took its first large leap forward, I traveled through several states, but no paper which I saw contained the statistics of the socialist vote. The only fact mentioned was that their vote had declined in one or two cities. When the Mercantile Inspection Bill, to which reference was made above, was before the New York legislature, one of the most respectable metropolitan, me, metropolitan newspapers contained frequent articles and interviews opposing the bill from the point of view of the department stores. One of my friends who championed the bill spoke to one of his friends on the staff of this paper and asked him in fairness to print an interview on the other side. The man replied, certainly that is only fair, I'll go and arrange for it. He returned and said that absolute orders had come from the counting room, that nothing in favor of the bill was to be printed. Now the justice and eff efficiency of democratic government depend on the intelligence and information of the citizens. If they are purposely misled by distorted information or by the suppression of important information, the larger jury before which all public causes have to be pleaded is tampered with and the innermost life of our republic is in danger. This of course is before the rise of public relations and mass advertising. So one can only imagine what Rauschenbusch would make of the present reality in the, in the area of mass manipulation. We'll put in a link to uh, a, a video we did on Ray Francis' comments. Uh, the Watchtower's response to criticism, shoot the messenger.